is an unspoiled network podcast. This is Spoil Me, covering Across the Wall, Nicholas Sayre and the Creature in the Case, Part One. In this episode, I am very, very excited about this story. I guess I wanted to say book, I guess book also, but this story mostly. And I am just so happy to see Nicholas again. Honestly, that's like the main thing. Welcome to Spoil Me. Welcome to the show, everyone. I am Natasha. Thank you very much to Abby for commissioning this episode. Um, I got in touch with Abby because depending on what lists you check of the Old Kingdom stories, it says different things are next after Clariel. Um, So I wasn't entirely sure what to cover next, if I should go into Golden Hand, which is the next like full novel. Um, And then this particular story is offered on Kindle, both as part of a collection, which is free to read on Kindle Unlimited, or as its own solitary story, which is $5, which doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me. Um, And I initially purchased it, I just searched for uh, Creature in the Case, and I found the $5 one and I bought it. And then I found that you could get all of the old kingdom stories together in one book free on Kindle Unlimited, which I have. So I went back and returned the other one and got this one. So if anybody is looking for it, it's uh, Across the Wall is the name of the story collection that I purchased this as a part of. Um, And I am just super duper into this, you guys. Um, for Thank you. I, I mentioned Abby commissioned this episode, but Abby was also the one who uh, talked me through what I should cover next. And I also asked her whether or not this warranted two episodes or if I should do it all in one. And she said, actually, Yama, she mentioned that you and her, she had talked about it and that it seemed two episodes would be best. And from where I'm at, that seems like a good idea because there's a lot to talk about here. So we all know... I heart Nicholas because I heart competence and any man who displays competence instantly becomes 80% more attractive to me. So there's that. Nicholas is not just competent, but he is very quick on his feet. And that is a literal as well as a figurative statement of fact that we get to see put to the test really well in this story. Um, It's interesting because like we saw all of Nicholas's potential in the last book and then that potential get cut short because he winds up getting entranced by Hedge and like forced with this infection basically of the shard from one of the hemispheres. His free will is taken away. So he doesn't get to fully express his potential and take advantage of his own faculties for most of the book because he is possessed and physically is getting so weakened by mistreatment. You know, he's malnourished. He isn't being protected from the elements, yada, yada, yada. Um, And also, of course, the genuine physical effects that happen from just that like free magic item being like wedged in his body. So there's a lot that was going on. And this book, he's still recovering from that. Like, he is not by any means back to his old self. And it's made very clear he will probably never be back to his old self. What he went through has marked him forever. And the the results from like the various medical tests that he's gotten are like weirdly inconclusive in that they can't tell exactly what's wrong with him because, hi, it's magic. But they agree that the effects appear to be the kind of effects that would happen to a soldier who had been through like a major war. Um, so Nick is still recovering from that, but this, this story is set in Ancel Stier, which 
is is like the first time that we have been in Ancelstier with a native Ancelstieran since Sabriel, because I consider her a native, even though she was born above the wall, she pretty much only knew a life below the wall, really, even though she's part of the Abhorsen family. Um, and even Sabriel, she's too connected to magic. So she doesn't really count. Like when I think of a native Ancelstieran, I think of people who don't believe in magic, who haven't seen this sort of thing. And, uh, even though we were in Nick's POV at the beginning of Lyriel, it's not the same being in his POV for a moment and then, you know, coming back and forth when he's like past the wall as it is being in the mind of one of the Ansel Steerans on their home turf. During what I guess one would consider a time of peace, even though that very quickly seems dispelled by what happens in this story. Um, so I find this super interesting. And, and I was happy there was like a little preface by Garth Nix about this, like the writing of the story. And he said that there was so much about Ansel Stier that he didn't really know because he admits in um, the preface that he doesn't sit down and figure out everything about a universe before he writes a story. He figures out what he needs to know to make that story work. And then we'll retroactively go back and start fitting things together that will so somehow just fit sometimes and other times he needs to rework things. And um, I have to confess, I really appreciate an author admitting that because so many authors try and behave as if they've got it all figured out from the start when it is objectively clear from their work, they cannot have had it all figured out or things would not have gone the way they went in other books. Yes, I'm looking at you, J.K. Rowling. So, I mean, it's fine. I am not mad at you for piecing things together because just sitting down and doing world building for like a year and a half before you actually even start your story is how you end up with the George R. R. Martins of the world where they have been writing for 40 years and aren't done yet. But I really like this seems to me to be the most reasonable way to go about world building is you figure out what you need for now. Then you come back and you figure other stuff out as you need it. And Ansel Steer has been a real mystery to me. I couldn't understand, and I still don't fully understand, and I've said this before, how people can live so close to the old kingdom and not believe in magic. It is so close. And there is some magic that does still work below the wall. It's not like the same, but it still does work some. And it's weird that people don't believe in it. And I like I had a huge problem with this in Lyriel and the way that Nick's attitude was towards magic. But I was willing to like deal with it because I felt like this was Garth Nick's needing Nick to have this sort of attitude. And now I'm in this place where I'm more angered by it than I was before because I'm realizing how many people believe or don't believe really in magic. But I'm also watching a world that thinks that the coronavirus is a conspiracy or caused by 5G when we have science. And I'm realizing that what people believe and think has zero to do with what you can go out and find out for yourself with minimal investigation or education. So what I'm saying is this used to seem unbelievable and all of a sudden it doesn't. And that's the world we live in. Thanks for coming. Um, so it's a real like, this is so much fun because in Solstier, I have not understood how people could live so close and not believe in magic. And I also was very thrown every time we get a reminder of the kind of technology that Ancestor has. They have electric lights, they have cars and trucks, you know, they have all this stuff that I was a little bit taken aback by 
every time I was reminded to the point where I kind of felt I didn't have a good grasp of where if I was going to try and put them during like into a period in our history and say, okay, they're at this level of technology. I couldn't think where they would fit. And I think in the preface, um, he mentions something. Yeah, here he, is. he says, this is a fantasy adventure story with a dash of country house mystery, a twist of 1920s style espionage and a humorous little umbrella on the side that may be safely ignored by those who don't like it or don't get it, which I don't know what that is, but we'll see. Um, once I read that and realized he was saying 1920s style espionage, that was super helpful. It doesn't need to adhere completely to what was, you know, available in the 1920s. But having that as just a sort of reference point made it much clearer for me where we were going and coming from, what to expect as far as like the capacity and capability of, of technology in the story and the quickness of communication. Um, that especially because, you know, if they don't have telephones then that changes everything. And even if they do have telephones, depending on what era of telephone, that's still not going to be super duper helpful. So finding out that that was what timeline we were working in, it's especially excellent for me because I've been mainlining um, Carrie Greenwood's Franny Fisher series, which are these wonderful female led mystery stories set in the 1920s in Australia. So I am feeling mired in 1920s era technology. My brain has just been saturated with it for like 16 books now. And I know when he says 1920s, exactly what he means in that regard. And also, I know what to expect with this party that is supposed to be happening at this house. So all of this to say, as soon as I started this story and realized what we were doing, that we were doing Ansel Stier, which I've spent barely any time in, we were going to be with Nicholas Sayre, who I really love and wanted so much to see more from, and that it was going to feel like a 1920s style sort of like mystery adventure story. I can't tell you how excited I was. This was just like exactly what I wanted, and I didn't even know I wanted it. And it is so far, I'm only halfway through it really, really good and really weird. So I'm going to back up a little bit and let's start at the beginning. Um, I didn't read, I'll mention too, he says something uh, in the little preface before the story itself. He talks about what this is. And then he says, here are the notes that I started with. And once I read that sentence, I didn't read any further because I felt like that was going to be too spoilery and I didn't want to see anything coming at all. So I bounced right out of there once I read that sentence. Um, so it starts off with Nicholas in the car with his uncle Edward, and he is telling to his, un to, he is telling his uncle his definite plans to get back to the old kingdom one way or another. And his father, he thinks as well as maybe his uncle potentially want him to have a very suitable, appropriate job uh, in Sayre and have a marriage and 2.5 children and all of that. Um, it's kind of an amusing conversation because Nicholas is coming at his uncle with a ton of suppositions and assumptions about what his uncle intends, both by bringing him to this party and for his life in general. Um, and his uncle starts off with just being like, dude, you're not going to Old Kingdom. You know you can't without a pass from me. I'm not getting you one. You wouldn't get it from anybody else. And you're not getting over it without a pass. But secondly, he says, I am trying to help you. And he says, I do not know why you or anyone else would want to go to the old kingdom, nor do I wish to annoy your father and hurt. Um, and he says, let's see, my year on the perimeter taught me the place is best avoided, nor do I wish to annoy your father and hurt your mother. But there are certain circumstances in which I might grant you permission to cross the perimeter. And this is when Nicholas is like, what do you wait, really? And he's like, yeah, um, think about it. Have I taken you? or any of my other nephews, or any of my nieces, to a house party before. 
And Nicholas says no. And he's like, yeah. So how about you use some of your brains and take note of the fact that this is a very strange occurrence that I do not normally indulge in and ask yourself why this might be happening. And basically goes on to tell him about District 13 or Department 13. I'm thinking district because of the uh, Hunger Games, but it could just be Department 13. Yeah, Department 13. Department 13 is similar to District 13 in that it's not supposed to exist, but we know it does. Um, and it's basically the Department of Mysteries, but not as official. The Department of Mysteries is a, like, it's an, a recognized part of the Ministry of Magic that people are aware of and there are people who are assigned to work there. Department 13 deals with uncanny things in that same way, but it is more like uh, the X-Files. They are not believed to really exist. And if they did, they would be seen as a joke. And we see indeed that one of the men who works in that department does see it as sort of a joke much to his own detriment later on, because he does just underestimates wildly the effectiveness of this experiment that they are about to embark on. Um, and he says, uh, Department 13 observes all our neighbors very successfully and has detailed files on everyone and everything important within those countries with one notable exception, the Old Kingdom. And Nicholas immediately reacts with, I'm not going to spy on my friends. And I love Edward is just so tired. He just sighs and looks out the window because he is trying to tell his fucking nephew. And his goddamn nephew will not shut the fuck up and listen to what he's trying to say before he just jumps to contradicting him or fighting him on something that he never even said in the first place. And I really like felt for him in this moment. There is nothing more annoying than a person that you're trying to have a conversation with and they keep trying to predict what you're going to say. Oh, it's super duper annoying. Um, and I know that I tend to do that with certain people and I really feel bad when I do it. Like I catch myself and I'm like, oh, I'm being so annoying. Um, so he says, all I want you to do is spend the weekend here with some of the department's technical people. Answer their questions about your experiences. I doubt anything will come of it. And as you know, I strictly adhere to the wisdom of my predecessors, which is to leave the place alone. But that said, they haven't left us alone over the past 20 years. Dorrance has always had a bit of a bee in his bonnet about the old kingdom, greatly exacerbated by the event at Forwin Mill. It is possible that he might discover something useful from talking to you. So if you answer his questions, you shall have your perimeter pass on Monday morning, if you are still set on going. So he, Edward tries to be like, all I have to do is answer his questions. And his uncle is like, well, you're going to have to go to like a dinner party and like mingle with people. You're just like, it's not just going to be show up, answer questions, leave. This is a, this is a weekend, you know, like, so do be your charming self essentially. And he gets dropped off. He really thinks that his uncle is going to come with him, but his uncle's like, no house parties are not for me. Thank you. But, you will do the thing and I will go hang out at a hotel and have a nice time by myself and maybe golf while you do whatever it is is going to happen here. And uh, he gets led by this dude who looks very much like a retired policeman. Uh, his name is Hodgman. But when he introduces himself, Nicholas hears hedge and recoils and almost falls, like he trips really badly. And I love this detail. I really appreciate Garth Nix taking the time to emphasize how affected Nicholas still is. He doesn't just say, oh, people said his body looked like he had been through a war, and then leave it at that for us to like, you know, fill in those blanks and 
that would just be a really easy and kind of lazy, really, way of getting this across. And granted, plot wise, it's actually kind of important later that he trips here because later he trips again and it's sort of like a cover that he has tripped once before and he's using the the reputation that he's gaining of being kind of unsteady to his advantage but nevertheless i just really like this being mentioned here because i think it's important to acknowledge going through something like what he did you don't just like come back and and move on with your life you know that is even without magic being a factor, even without like the possession and the violation that that is, just being held captive and mistreated the way he was, that is bad enough and would still cause this kind of trauma, you know? Um, so he almost like trips and then he excuses himself by saying that his ankle gave way. And this man tells him that he, his name is Hodgman and that he is the assistant to Mr. Dorrance. Um, the other guests do not arrive until later. So Mr. Dorrance thought you might like a tour of the grounds. And this is pretty direct. This guy is like, so why don't I sh show you the library first, which is the best room. And immediately we go to the underground secret society of department 13. I really rather enjoyed, um, they go into the library and he goes and like pulls on a, a certain book and nothing happens. And Hodgman, like Nick looks at him and says, is something supposed to happen? And you think, yeah, you pull the book and like a magic door opens. And then he says it gets a bit stuck sometimes and then pulls the book all the way out and opens it. And there's a key in the book. So it's not like a lever or any sort of thing at all. So then I'm like, oh, is he just going to like open a door with a key that's hidden? That's much less dramatic than what I was expecting, but that's kind of funny. And then he uses the key and that opens this crazy like secret door. So I got my like expectations flipped around a couple of times. And honestly, I was kind of impressed. Um, so Nick is going down the stairs and we really get a good description of how confusing this whole place feels because at first he's just going down a uh, long like set of stairs um i think they're like cement stairs that go about 40 feet into the ground they uh they end in front of a door that has a little peephole in it and they have to be allowed through and then when they go through that there's another doorway and there's like an alcove with a desk and a phone and a guard. And they wind up going through several more of these corridors coming across progressively more and more well-established guards and security. And there are several, you know, hallways and corridors that he has to choose between so it's not just going down the corridor every time he has to go in different directions and you really get the sense of him being disoriented and feeling a little bit like he's in a maze um and eventually they get to the main room where uh there's like a it, he, it's described as a much more cheerful room like a study and it's got a bunch of club chairs and a big like desk and table and um, a liquor cabinet and everything. And the, the closest was a tall, expensively dressed, vacant looking man with ridiculous sideburns whom Nick recognized as Dorrance. The second closest was a 50 ish man in a hearty tweed coat with leather elbow patches. The skin of his thick neck hung over his collar and his fat face was too big for the half moon glasses that perched on his nose. Lurking behind these two was a nondescript, vaguely unhealthy looking shorter man who wore exactly the same kind of suit as Hodgman, but in a much more untidy way. So he looked nothing like a policeman serving or otherwise. Um, so he gets introduced to Professor Lackridge, who we find out later does not believe in any of the garbage that Dorrance is talking about. 
and is sort of humoring Doran's just out of interest. Um, and then we meet Mr. Malfin. And he calls him an independent advisor on Old Kingdom matters. And he, Malfin, when he greets Nicholas, sort of does the kind of movement that it says made a faint repressed gesture with his hands, turning them toward his forehead as if to brush his almost non-existent hair away. Nick has a charter mark. And it seems like there's part of like that gesture is in relation to the charter mark, even though Mr. Malthan doesn't himself have one. Um, and let's see. Boop, boop, boop. I'm trying to find. Oh, yeah, here it is. Um, it was unusual for ever for anyone from the old kingdom to be encountered this far south. Very few travelers could get authorization from both King Touchstone and Ensel Steering government to cross the wall and the perimeter. Even fewer would come any farther south than Bane, which was at least 180 miles north. They didn't like it as a rule. It didn't feel right, Sam had always said. But then this little man didn't have the charter mark on his forehead, which might make it more bearable for him to be on this side of the wall. Um, so Nick makes sure to like move the hair out of the way on his forehead so that this guy can see the mark. And uh, he comes forward and tells him that he's a traitor, um, that he lives in Belisere. Uh, he says, I've always done a bit of business with some folks in Bane, as my father did before me and his father before him. We have a permission from the king and a permit from your government. I only come down here every now and then when I've got something special like that I know Mr. Dorrance's lot will be interested in, same as my old dad did for Mr. Dorrance's granddad. And at this point, Dorrance interrupts and is like, yeah, and we pay him a lot for that. And he's like, yeah, I do. You do. And then continues on, only I don't. And Professor Lackridge cuts him off and says, Malthan has been very useful, though we must discount many of his traveler's tales. He And basically insinuates that this guy has a couple of nuggets of truth amongst a bunch of absolute horseshit that he tries to feed us. And uh, Lackridge calls the charter mark a brand of that cult, as he puts it. Um sociologically interesting of course pra particularly its regrettable prevalence among our northern perimeter reconnaissance unit i trust it's only an affectation in your case young man you haven't gone native on us um and nick meanwhile fucking knows precisely where this guy's coming from because he used to think the same thing so he's trying very much to be as measured and diplomatic in his replies as he can even though this guy sounds like a fucking moron because he doesn't know what he's talking about um and lackridge when he says like it's a connection to magic lackridge says i'm sure it seems like magic to you i'm just like oh god i hate you so much so at this point, they talk about how Forwin Mill is like one of the few truly inexplicable things that has happened because he says everything else can be explained as mass hallucination, drugs, whatever. But the thing at Forwin Mill, genuinely nobody knows what to make of it because the blast, he says, was equivalent to the detonation of 20,000 tons of nitrocellulose. And he's like, talks about how the only thing that they found that was considered a quote bomb was two hemispheres that were only 10 feet across. And they can't figure out how anything that size could possibly have delivered this kind of explosion. Also, they don't ask because they obviously cannot believe the truth of this. But Nick was like, way close to this explosion and survived and we know that that was due to magic but i am assuming that they probably just discount that he was as close as he says um so nick tries to say i get i i know what you're saying but i was wrong and you are wrong and not not everything is explicable under the kind of science that we use and dorance says you're tired and clearly still somewhat unwell. 
We have many questions, but they can wait until the morning. Professor, why don't you show Nicholas around the establishment and let him get his bearings, then go back upstairs and we can all resume life as normal. Um, and Nicholas, for his part, is really not wanting to take this little trip down memory lane. And it wouldn't have been so bad if Lackridge was the only one questioning him because Lackridge, clearly he does not believe in the magic or what Nick went through, which kind of makes it easier to talk about because he won't ask the questions that Nick doesn't want to answer and doesn't want to think about. But he can see that Dorrance does believe much more than Lackridge. He never like said it, but he doesn't, there's nothing in his body language or attitude to indicate that he finds this to all be a big joke. And it says Nick definitely did not want to discuss the destroyer and its nature with anyone who might seriously look into what it was or what had happened at Forwin Mill. He didn't want to dabble in anything to do with Old Kingdom magic, especially without proper instruction, even 200 miles south of the wall. And later on, he says something about how Dorrance gives him the impression of being somebody who could potentially fall into the same behavior and evil, essentially, that Hedge did. He's got a vibe to him. And I really enjoy that because there is something when you meet certain people that you just immediately are like, yeah, nah, I don't trust you at all. Like you can, it's, it's not always right. Sometimes I have been known to misjudge people, wildly misjudge them, but there are times. And I think we all know them where you just immediately are like, mm -hmm, don't like you. Um, so Malfin, uh, Lackridge says, follow me, Nicholas, you too, Malfin. I want to show you something related to those photographic plates you found for us. Malfin is trying to get out of there and go home. And Dorrance is like, we're paying you extra to stay with this attitude. That's like, there's absolutely no question. Malfin is going to do precisely what he is told. Later on, it is made even more plain that Malfin means nothing to them. And there is a real sense that they might kill him or at the very least imprison him. Something is going on. Um, we get a few instances. Uh, there's a paperweight and there's also Nick's dagger. That was a gift, I think, from Lyriel, he says, that have charter marks engraved on them. And we are specifically told that they are completely dormant. The The charter marks are not moving. They are not glowing. There is nothing alive about them the way they are, there is above the wall. Um, and when they walk out, uh, Lackridge mentions how confusing it is. And there's part of me that feels like he is going, he wants to sort of employ that in trapping Malthan if he has to, but that winds up sort of working against them once this fucking thing gets loose. Um, so Nick mentions photographic plates, uh, that, that were talked about earlier. And Lackridge says, these are prints from negative glass plates taken in Bain of a book that was brought across the wall. Malfin looked at Nick, but his eyes failed to meet the younger man's gaze. The photographs were taken by a former associate of mine. I didn't know she had this book. It burned of its own accord only minutes after the photographs were captured. Half the plates also melted before I could get them far enough south. I am dying to know what this book is and if it's something that we've seen before or what the hell. Like, I assume that there's some sort of charter magic involved in the book that causes it to self-destruct like that. But I have no idea. Um... And Nick says, what was the title of the book and why former associate? She burned with the book and whispered mouth and with a shiver. I do not know its name. I do not know where Rallyes might have got it. Um, and Lackridge, for his part, is like the the plates probably aren't even from a book. Like, I'm sure that, 
you know, he, he has all of these explanations. Um, there are very fine etchings, though, that are of some interest. And then says, at least one of the creatures in that book does exist. We have some independent evidence. And Malthan is like, what do you mean independent evidence? And Lackridge opens the door and says this. And there's a fucking 10 foot high by five foot wide glass case with a fucking creature. Y'all know how I feel about Gar Garth Nix's creature designs. So I'm going to read this to you. I, after I'm done with this story, going to Google the creature in the case, like, you know, creature illustrations, but I don't know how many of you listened to the end of the last book. I Googled the uh, free magic creatures that were with Clarial and got quite a shock. They looked real freaky. Um, I'm just interested to see what this looks like if somebody illustrates it. It looked vaguely human in the sense that it had a head, a torso, two arms and two legs. But its skin or hide was that of a strange violet cross hatched with lines like a crocodile's and looked very rough. Its legs were jointed backward and ended in hooked hooves, which I can't even imagine what hooked hooves look like. The arms stretched down almost to the floor of the case and ended not in hands, but in club-like appendages that were covered in inch-long barbs. Its torso was thin and cylindrical, rather like that of a wasp. Its head was the most human part, save that it sat on a neck that was twice as long. It had narrow slits instead of ears, and its black, violet-pupiled eyes, presumably glass made by a skillful taxidermist, were pear-shaped and took up half its face. As soon as it said, presumably made of glass, I was like, this motherfucker's alive. Oh, you fucking fuck. I just, as soon as he did this, I was just like, mm -mm, that shit ain't glass, though. You know it's not. I was not happy about it. Its mouth, twice the width of any human's, was almost close, closed, but Nick could see gleaming teeth there. Yama says, I googled it, no thanks. <laughs> if you can, if there is an illustration that isn't spoilery of just the creature, feel free to share that with me, Yama. I'll click the link. Um, but yeah. Poor Malfin fucking runs down that fucking corridor as far away from this thing as he can get to the next door that's still locked behind them and pounds on the fucking door. Malfin is not okay. Malfin is freaking out. Nick, meanwhile, is having a familiar feeling that hasn't happened in a while of feeling excited about discovering something. Uh, it says it was a feeling he had always enjoyed uh, the excitement of discovery of learning something new. It had been lost to him ever since he dug up the metal spheres of the destroyer. He leaned forward to touch the case and felt a strange electric thrill run through his fingers and out along his thumbs. At the same time, there was a stabbing pain in his forehead strong enough to make him step back and press two fingers hard between his eyes. Lackridge, for his part, is trying to be like, yeah, pretty cool specimen, huh? But he's like staring at Nick and really wanting to know what his reaction is here. And we find out that Doran sort of directed him to pay attention because he thought there might be something specific that happened if somebody with a charter mark came near this thing. Ooh, Yama shared with me a link. I am about to click it. Ooh. Ooh. No. Mm -mm. No, mm -mm. Mm -mm. it's real weird, guys. It's real weird. I'm out. I'm out. Um, let's see. Apparently, the thing was found about 10 miles, uh, 10 miles in on our side of the wall, wrapped in three chains, one of silver, one of lead, and one made from braided daisies, which I am fucking so curious about. 
That's what the notes say, though, of course, we don't have the chains to prove it. Um, long before the perimeter, of course. So it was some time before the authorities got a hold of it. Uh, and basically says something about these like captain inquirers that used to exist where they could like sort of um, take ownership of artifacts like this and do whatever they wanted. And now they can't because of the government being involved. But evidently, uh, Dorrance would have liked to have been a captain inquirer. Um, and so is, would Lackridge. So do, do, do. come back here, Mr. Moth, and it won't bite you. As Lackridge spoke, Nick thought he saw the creature's eyes move just a fraction, but there was a definite sense of movement with it. All his sense of excitement was banished in a second to be replaced by growing fear. It's alive, thought Nick. He stepped back toward the door, almost knocking over Lackridge, his mind working furiously. The thing is alive, quiescent. Is it quiescent? Is that how you say that? Conserving its energies so far from the old kingdom, it must be some free magic creature and it's just waiting for a chance. And Nick is suddenly like, okay, you know what? We are getting out. I, I, I want a cup of tea. I want to get the fuck out. And Lackridge is like, Dorrance wanted me to make Malfin touch the case and see what he, what the reaction was. And Nick is looking at fucking Malkin whimpering, crouched by the door, desperate to get away. And it's like, oh, you don't need to see any more than this. That is his reaction. Going and making him touch the fucking thing. It would just be cruel. Don't do it. And this is when Lackridge says... He's only an old kingdom traitor. He's not even strictly legal, conditional visa. We can do whatever we like with him. And Nick is like, excuse me? And Lackridge tries to sort of amend it and be like, well, within reason, I mean, you know, nothing drastic. And I'm like, yeah, okay, you can't take back what you fucking just said, sir. We can do whatever we like with him and then be like, well, I don't mean anything bad. Nobody says that. It doesn't mean anything bad. Um, so Nick is realizing, like, all of a sudden, it's all clicking into place that Department 13 is really seeming like a fucking sketchball. It's like one thing to say that there's a sort of like secret department that does its own thing. And it's another thing to have apparently little to no oversight and have these guys just poking around and shit they don't understand experimenting however the fuck they feel like it. We find out that there is a little oversight, but it's, you know, not enough considering what is allowed to happen here, obviously. Um, so let's see. Nick says, perhaps uh, we can, me and uh, Malfin can walk out together. Um, Mr. Dorrance was most insistent. I'm sure he won't mind if you tell him that I escort, uh, insisted on escorting Malthin. I am insisting, you know, as it is, I shall have a few words to say about this place to my uncle. If you're going to be like that, I don't think I have any choice, said Lackridge petulantly. We were assured that you would cooperate fully with our research. I will cooperate, but I don't think Malthin needs to do any more for Department 13. He bent down and helped the old kingdom trader up. He was surprised by how much the smaller man was shaking. He seemed totally in the grip of panic, though he calmed a little when Nick took him by, uh, took his arm above the elbow. Now please show us out and you can organize someone to take mouth into the railway station. And Lackridge is still fucking like arguing his point, but he's at the same time opening doors and leading them through. And seems to be cooperating. But then we get this moment, and I love this. Sergeant Hodgman, Lackridge called out rather too loudly. Please ex escort Mr. Sarah upstairs and have one of your other officers take Malthin to Dorrance Halt and see he gets on the next northbound train. Very good, sir, replied Hodgman. He hesitated for a moment. Then, with a curiously unpleasant emphasis, which Nick would have missed if he hadn't been paying careful attention, he said, Constable Ripton, you see to Malthin. 
Just a moment, said Nick. I've had a thought. Mouthen can take a message from me over to my uncle, the chief minister, at the Golden Chief. Then someone from his staff can take Mouthen to the nearest station. Sergeant Hodgman tries to be like, one of my men can bring a message. That's fine. You don't need to send him. And Nick's like, no, no. I'm pretty sure he would want to hear from Mouthen directly. Unless that is a problem somehow for some reason. I love the way that he plays this. He's just like, Sarah, any any particular thing that you had planned that wouldn't line up with this? I don't... It's mysterious. Gee, what could you possibly have intended to do? Ugh, these guys are sinister. Um, he says, I'll just write something out for you to take to Garen, my uncle's principal secretary. So Nick takes out his like pen and pencil and pretends to write something and then scribble it out, pull that paper off and start over. But what he did was actually write something pull it off, crumple it up in his hand. And then he gives Malthin the one note, but stuffs the second note directly into his hand. And I really, really love how many ways Nick tries to poke holes in what's happening here. First of all, the writing of two notes is Another example of him thinking on his feet. This is the shit that I like. I, that was what made me fall in love with Nick in the, the previous book was, or the book before previous, I guess now, was how thorough he was and, and, and how, like, even if he didn't necessarily believe a thing, he was like, well, I'll, I'll deal with what I'm looking at though, you know? And this writing two notes so that they can check one and think they've got it. And there's another one that says a whole other thing is already a good idea. But then he also tries to see who he can distract here by being like, well, what's that at one point when he talks about cockroaches? And I really love the policeman is the uh, they all keep staring at Nick and he realizes that these are professionals like this is his sussing out exactly how competent these guys are and it's very clear they all are watching every move he's about to make because they know he's on to them and up to no good so this gets him a little bit more freaked out because he's realizing that like this isn't going to be as easy as he thought he was he's doing this to try and slip the note to Malfin, but none of them are like fucking playing along. Um, and he also is like pretty secure in his own standing being the nephew of whatever the fucking his uncle's like position is. Basically everybody that he is related to is somebody that is high up enough that if something were to happen to him, it would be news. That would be a difficult thing to hide. And probably his relatives would come down on these people hard. And he has to depend on that quite a bit here. Because it's obvious that if he were anyone else, even slightly less important, likely he would not be walking up out of here. And as it is, he doesn't really get to walk up out of here the way that he thought anyway. Um, so he, this is where he pretends to sort of trip and slips the other note into Malfin's hand. Um, and he says, I'll, I'll telephone ahead to make sure that my uncle's staff are expecting you and have dinner laid on. But we wind up finding out later that the telephone does not work. Um, so let's all get upstairs, Nick said, with false cheer. He dredged up from somewhere. After you, Sergeant. Malthin, if you wouldn't mind walking with me, I'll see you to your car. Got a couple of questions about the old kingdom I'm sure you can answer. Um, and let's see. <laughs> Lackridge coughed something that might have been Dorrance, scuttled to the door leading back to the tunnels, opened it just wide enough to admit his bulk, and squeezed through. 
Um, but with Lackridge gone, there was no longer a witness. Nick knew Malfin didn't count, not to anyone in Department 13. So the sergeant steps forward and is like right up in Nick's face and just stares him down. Nick realized the stare hid a mind calculating how far he could go to keep Malfin captive and what he might be able to do to Nicholas Sayre without causing trouble. My uncle is the chief minister, Nick whispered very softly. My father is a member of the moot. Marshal Harngorm is my mother's uncle. My second cousin is the hereditary arbiter himself. As you say, sir, said Hodgman loudly. He stepped back, the sound of his heel on the concrete snapping through the tension that had risen in the room. I'm sure you know what you're doing. That was a warning of consequences to come, Nick knew, but he didn't care. He wanted to save Malthin, but most of all, at that moment, he wanted to get out under the sun again. He wanted to stand above ground and put as much earth and concrete and as many locked doors as possible between himself and the creature in the case. Yet even when the afternoon sunlight was softly warming his face, Nick wasn't much comforted. He watched Constable Ripton and Malthin leave in a small green van that looked exactly like the sort of vehicle that would be used to dispose of a body in a moving picture about the fictional Department 13. I loved that line. So he's watching as like various people arrive for this party and he's only half paying attention and thinking about the notes that he wrote. So there's the one that went to the secretary. Uncle will want to talk to the bearer, Malthin, an old kingdom trader, for five minutes or so. Please ensure he is then escorted to the perimeter by Fox's people. I ask Uncle to call me urgently. And then the one that he had put stuffed in his hand, send telegram to Magistrix Wiverly College, Nick found bad kingdom creature, Dorrance Hall, tell Abhorse and help. And Nick has done this, but is still, again, so good. Because he do does this and is still not satisfied. He is not depending on either of these things to do the job. He's like, well, that's one thing that I did. But I really should cover my bases like a couple more times because probably that's not going to work. Um, and he goes back inside and tries to, he asks to use the telephone. And the butler uh, is like, I am so sorry. The line is down. It's probably not going to get fixed for a couple of days. This is the kind of thing that it's like, you know, I, I, it, all I can think of with this is uh, get out and just the idea of like being in a house where other people all know what's going on and you are at their uh, mercy, you know, I just really liked the tension of this building up where you're not sure who is in on it and not, and who is in on it fully understanding what they're even in on is the other thing, you know? Um, to, 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 let's see. Nick retreated to his room ostensibly to dress for dinner. In practice, he spent most of the time writing a report to his uncle and another telegram to the magistrix at Wooverly College. He hid the report in the lining of his suitcase and went in search of a particular valet who he knew would be accompanying one of the guests. I loved this. He figures all the staff is probably in on it. They're probably all working for Department 13. So best to go to the servant of somebody who does not live in the house. Um, Danger's valet was famous among servants for his ability with shoe polish, champagne, and a secret oil. So neither he nor anyone else in the below stairs parlor was much surprised when the chief minister's nephew sought him out with a pair of shoes in hand. The valet was a little more surprised to find a note inside the shoes, asking him to go out to the village and secretly send a telegram. But as the note was wrapped around four double guinea pieces, he was happy to do so. When he'd finished his duties, of course. So this all gets me all set up thinking, oh, he's fucking taking care of that shit. But then it ends with when he's finished his duties. And I'm like, no, go now. I'm going. Like, I just really I wanted to, like, just reach through and just shake the guy. Um, and, you know, again, writing this report and hiding it in the lining of the suitcase, like 
the, just all of this is just very well thought out. Like Nick is really firing on all cylinders trying to like figure this out, you know? Um, but to do Nick went to his case and took out a large leather wallet. There were three things inside. Two were letters, both written neatly on thin, uh, on thick linen, rich handmade paper. So the first one is from Samoth. Um, and Samoth apparently talks a lot about the projects that he's working on. Cause he's still doing like, uh, the enchantment of like small magical objects because he's part of the, what are they called again? The construction worker guys fabricators no that's from the grisha series um foreman Ugh, something like that but he is talking about creating a magical hand for lyriel because remember she lost her hand at the end of the last book um so that's pretty fun and then the other one is from lyriel and this is one of those that's interesting because uh, Nick didn't read, bother to read Sam's letter again, but he did unfold the second letter and read it for the hundredth or two hundredth time, hoping this time he would uncover some hidden meaning in the innocuous words. So obviously Nick has started to develop some feelings for Lyriel, and this very friendly letter is something that he is obsessing over. Because he wants her to have feelings for him, too, and is trying to read into it as much as he possibly can. And he wonders about the fact that it's like so perfectly like in perfectly written letter in terms of like her handwriting is so even and there's no splotched ink or anything. And he thinks that uh, maybe she made a first copy of the letter and then copied it out again. I assumed personally that she used magic to write this letter because she do doesn't have her right hand anymore. Um, but, you know, he's hopeful that she just cared so much about presenting him with a nice letter that she just like, you know, made a second copy to send him, which is just precious, honestly. Um, and then he takes out the third thing, which is the dagger. Um and it's got the the charter marks on it that apparently are like, you know, uh, dormant. And somebody comes to his door and it's a woman who says that her name is Tessria. Don't say you don't remember me. Perhaps a glimpse will remind you. Let me in. I've got a bottle of champagne. I thought we might have a drink before dinner. Nick didn't remember her, but that didn't mean anything. He knew she would have singled him out from the seating plan for dinner, homing in on the surname, Sayre. He supposed he should at least tell her to go away to her face. So he goes and answers the door. And there is a couple of dudes there that grip him up and knock him out with chloroform. And the woman it's is described as pale melancholy eyes in a very white face, a forced smile from two red lips. And I'm very curious who this woman is. If she is like a patsy as well, if she's real pale because they like forced her to pretend this thing, or is she part of it all, you know? And yeah, exactly. Yama just posted in the chat, poor Nick. And exactly like, Nick has been through so much and for him to get snatched like this again is really fucking unreasonable. Like Garth Nix, you mean. Um, so Nick passes out and wakes up in the dark. He can't move. And at first he thinks he's paralyzed. And then he realizes that he is just being restrained and tied down. And here's fucking Dorrance. And he is, he has a little hose set up and he is taking some of Nick's blood and has it going through the hose directly into the mouth of the creature from the case, which is sitting on the table next to Nick's, uh, like at a slightly lower level so that the gravity can run his blood down into its mouth. And Nick tries to fight back, tries to get away 
Dorrance tells him, I'm only taking a pint. This will all be just a nightmare in the morning and you won't even remember what even happened. You'll think you got drunk. And I'm reading this like, you're pouring blood into this thing's mouth and you think that this is going to be a calm situation in which he wakes up in the morning and you guys get a chance to put him back. You really think that's how this is going to go. It is how he thinks it's going to go because he's a fucking moron who doesn't know how to deal with this stuff. This is when the lights go out. The light bulb explodes and the fucking thing sits up, which just it's so without ceremony. You know, it's not even like he heard something moving and he knew and blah, blah, blah. It's like all of a sudden the light bulb explodes. He smells the weird free magic smell and it sits up. And that's it's just like it's so sudden. And Dorrance is yelling, what are you doing? I'll bring you blood, whatever kind you need. And there was a tearing sound and flickering light suddenly fill the ro- filled the room. Nick saw the creature silhouetted in the doorway, holding the heavy door it had just ripped from its steel hinges. It threw this aside and strode out into the corridor, lifting its head back to emit a hissing shriek that was so high pitched it made Nick's ears ring. Dorrance, meanwhile, is like, what happened? That wasn't part of the deal. You fucking idiot. And apparently he was like dreaming and getting instructions from this creature in his dreams and followed those instructions and is in this like mindset that this thing is some sort of god that is goddess he keeps calling it a female and she said he said that she said sarah's blood was too rich and that there's something wrong with it which i assume is his connection to the charter as weak as it is down here probably is pretty like harmful to her um so nicholas like he winds up getting uh like Dorrance initially wraps a bandage around his arm because he's still bleeding. Um and when Dorrance is saying, I've long dreamed of waking her, Nick corrects him and says it, and Dorrance smacks him. He backhands him. I just can't. What an unexpected reaction. He says, you are not worthy to speak of her. She is a goddess. She should never have been sent away. My father was a fool. Fortunately, I am not. And I'm like, "Mm, aren't you, though? Nick winds up getting locked to the table with these old fashioned handcuffs and he cannot get away and winds up just having to basically lay there until somebody can come and rescue him. And by the time they do... It's Constable Ripton and he, like Nick asks, has it killed anyone? And Lackridge just kind of explodes with laughter and is like, are you kidding me? It's killed practically everybody down here and it's about to go upstairs. And we tried to shoot it with bullets from up close and our guns stopped working. We tried to shoot it with bullets from far away and they just bounced off. Nothing we do is having the slightest effect on it at all. And they figure out that there's a second way to get upstairs using the dumbwaiter. And they have to get up there and try and warn everybody who's coming to this party and to dinner to get the fuck out of the building before the thing can work its way through the main doors into the house and kill all of them. And that is where I stopped reading. And it was tough. I'm not going to lie to you guys. It was really tough to stop there. This is a very fun story. I really like this. Um, I'm over time by a few minutes here, so I'm going to wrap up. But um, but yeah, thank you again very much to Abby for commissioning this episode. Thank you to Yelma for being in the chat and sharing with me the image. I hated it. Um, and I'm just really excited to read the rest of this. So actually, while I'm on that... Why don't I check and see when the next one is? I always have a um I always have a hard time finding this because I forget that it's like called the Old Kingdom 
series. So let's see. Today is the 8th. The next one is on the 15th. So not too long now. Yay! Oh, I'm excited. All right, guys. Thank you all so much for listening. I hope you've been enjoying them. And I will see you again soon with a new episode. Until then, toodaloo, motherfuckers. Spoiled Network Podcast.